Hello, my name is Bene Taschen and I would like to show you the retrospective exhibition with Larry Fink. And yeah, welcome. This, this is the gallery. And actually, we are honored to have um, yeah, Larry Fink, who's just turning 80 a couple of weeks ago, not actually a couple of weeks ago, last week, to have him uh, here on Zoom and to have a conversation with him. Hi, Larry. How are you? <laughs> that was good, Larry. Huh? <laughs> Fine, thank you. <laughs> good to see you, you know. You look good in the dark, you know, but I also like you in the light, you know. Yeah, it's not often that I hide underneath my vest, but for, ah, okay. for you, Benny, anything goes. Okay, that, that's good. I'm, I'm happy to hear this. So, yeah, we are going here now through your exhibition, the retrospective show which have showed the last 65 years of your work, and we will maybe start here with this beautiful image. You actually took this in 1958, and so uh, how did you start with photography? My father gave me a small camera, thinking that perhaps I would like it, and it seems that I liked it quite a bit. <laughs> The most important thing, or perhaps a very important thing, is that my parents were very supportive of the arts. They were very much a, a left-wing family, so anything that I would do photographically would be saturated with social concerns, but yet at the same time with, with the deeper concerns of beauty. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm not like a photojournalist, even though I do photojournalism, I have done it. And I'm not specifically involved with the event in front of me. I'm involved with the, what it looks like, what it feels like, what it smells like, what it has, what it offers to me and how it makes me feel. And through those feelings of the experience, I make the photograph. I don't think I've ever had a normal moment in my life. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I tend to get on scenes or inside scenes and hang out with people of all kinds of, of ilk that are highly emotional and highly rebellious. Uh, and these guys were certainly that. And we were traveling through America in two cars um, looking for truth and honesty and literature and jazz music and drugs and um, we found all of those things and yeah you started photographing this i think in the 70s you know you photographed two different scenes you know once you know the scene in new york the people in new york and then at the same time uh yeah people in martin Screep. so how came you up with this idea it wasn't an idea, it was an actuality of experience. The stuff in New York was very much based on a certain kind of politic, which is to say, what do the wealthy, or what do the fancy, or what do the well-bred, or what, do, what, uh, what are they actually, how, who are they? The of others, and so that I would photograph, and plus the fact that I really am involved with voluptuousness and with beauty with the idea that I can make a photograph into such an illusion that the person looking at the photograph can feel like they are touching something within the photograph. The idea is sensuality, the deepest part of life has to be fulfilled and it has to be in fulfilled with intelligence and thought. Which was the difference between Martin's Creek in the country where I live and New York is that it wasn't an idea. It was just that I bu I, I got involved the fa with the family, the Sabatines, uh, by one way or the other, and started to photograph them. They were so out front and so without any holes. Uh, unlike the the wealthy people of New York, who were 
very much living out of the corner of their eye in terms of how people would see them. Uh, the Martin's Creekers, the Sabatines, had no concern whatsoever. I look like that. Church, do what you want. I don't care. So this is, I think, your neighbor. You know, she's always uh, greets you warmly. Her name was Jeannie Sabatine, and she's dead now by some years. And she was a rebel. And John, her husband, was the town policeman. When his first wife died, the wife of all the children, he married Jeannie. Jeannie was, was the, not necessarily a prostitute, but a tart. So she was the town tart, and John was the police captain. That's the marriage you have to make in life. <laughs> yeah, sounds like a good combination, huh? I think so. Both very powerful. Yeah. I have to tell you a little story about this picture. Do you mind? It was way back in the G. Willikers 70s or 80s when radical feminism was very much on the surface of many, many people's mouths. And I had a lecture at a place called the Midtown Y, which was a great photographic center back in those days. And some very, very serious women in the back of the lecture hall, it wasn't that big, confronted me saying that the picture was a sexist picture, that all I was interested in was in the young woman's uh, breasts, which were coming forward like that. And I was like incredulous because that was not at all my interest, even though they're in there like bodies should be. I was interested in the joy and in the splendor of their energy. And so there you go historical politics and whatnot like that and actual intention go get into a very conflicted mode. So this is basically yeah, very close where you live. So uh, how, how, what, or let's say you, you born and raised in Brooklyn, in New York. And, um, and since 45 years now, you, you're living in, in Pennsylvania. So what was, uh, what was one of the main reasons you moved to Pennsylvania? Well, I was married to uh, Joan Snyder, the wonderful painter, American painter, and she wanted to move to the country, and I didn't at that time. I'd rather be on the avenue in New York, but since it was, Joni wanted that, let's do that, and we kept the place in New York. But once I got to the country, the first year was trouble, because I was so big and so much to do and the, the farm itself was pretty run down so I had to fix everything. I know how to I know how to build and do electric and plumbing and whatnot. So I worked every day, all the day, working on this farm. I photographed every once in a while but basically was hauling a lot of wires. <laughs> And that's Martha going into the forest, and that's Martha, my wife now, Martha Posner, the beauty. And that's the farm a long, long time ago. <laughs> Music is everything. Yeah, you were photographing musicians like for a long time, you know, in this book also somewhere there's music. And we see here also a very beautiful photograph here from the GQ party here. All of my, when I was a young person, I never had photographer heroes, except perhaps, perhaps Henri Cartier-Bresson. And I mm -hmm. didn't necessarily hang around with photographers. I hung around with musicians, and they were my heroes, jazz musicians. Coleman Hawkins and Jimmy Rushing. Steve Lacey was a dear, dear, dear buddy of mine. Roswell Rudd, Archie Shepp. All of these guys were, Sheila Jordan, guys and gals, you know, were my friends. Because music is the, is the art form, I guess, or the life force. 
which liberates me in the deepest way. Photography certainly has its deep deeps in my life, the deepest of all places, I guess. But music, somehow or another, is the thing that allows me to smile and bleed, die and live all in the same moment. I've never really had a fixation on stars or celebrities mm -hmm. and I, while I watch movies I don't watch I don't watch them for the for the for the cameo in other words for the star you know studded uh, idea I'm not intimate with all the stars so when I went to these parties many times I was photographing very very famous and very important actors and stuff but I didn't really know it uh, because of my ignorance naivete and so on and so forth and so it was i was just photographing people with within their own psychodrama and their own dilemma and their own frivolity and whatever was the evening was going to bring for them and i was just there to receive the energy that they were bringing to each other by just being simply alive Black and white, of course, is reductive, so it takes to it takes color palette out of out of the out of the conversation. And since I'm interested in form and in light and in emotionality and life life force in a very very extemporaneous way or a spontaneous way, okay. where you have to be super fast in order to capture those little moments of soul and whatever else. Mm -hmm. um, you can't with color with reds and blues and pinks and greens and browns and and silvers coming in front of your frame at the same time as all of those forms and emotions and stuff like that is just a little bit too much for me to handle with a guy named Jimmy Jacobs who was Mike Tyson's manager after mm -hmm. Customato died and I had an assignment from a magazine called Manhattan Inc. Kathleen Kletch gave me the assignment to go photograph Jimmy Jacobs up in Catskill, New York where they trained and lived. Mike Tyson wasn't champion and young and he was agile and he was very powerful. And I photographed him and Jimmy and that whole scenario. And somehow or another, it became ingrained within my whole psychological system that I had to be, I think I spent seven or eight years photographing that scenario. And it was utterly fascinating to me. And then I must say that if I went back to that scenario right now, even though it's diminished as a sport in the national eye, I would absolutely be involved with it again because it has innocence and triumph and corruption and despair and it has the beauty of bodies and the ugliness of fatty mercantile traders who trade in the bodies and in the strength and the courage of those young guys. I spent three, four days with him, photographing him and his crew, Ingrid and Edie and 
Malanga and whatnot. And this was sort of, a, if you will, a quasi fashion shoot. It was done for a magazine called the East Side Review. It never got published. It was a literary magazine which didn't have a lot of money, so it didn't go on. But I got the photographs, and that was that. The <clears throat> as far as Andy was concerned, and everybody nowadays is very, very much like he's a creative genius, and he's a so and so forth, this and that, and this and that. And I always just thought he was a, just a whore. Um, and even though he had graphic abilities and certain certain inventive, you know, ways of making paintings, and also to commer commercialize and to commodify paintings more so than anybody else previous to four. So for me, he was just a, a white boy with nihilistic tendencies who hung around with rich folks to, in order to gain favor and to be on the scene. At that time in life, I was hanging out with Malcolm X. Yeah, this photograph from Mac Malcolm X was from 1963 and you just also had an exhibition at the Fotografiska in New York and they also showed works over there. So how was this day for you when you uh, when you met or photographed uh, Malcolm X? This was in front of the St. Teresa Hotel and it was a big rally and so on. I used to go to see Malcolm at the um, ballroom where he spoke every Thursday night because I was working as a teacher up there in Harlem in 1963, 1964. He was a powerful man and his words were very, very, very precise and very pointed and very real. And since I was a left-wing guy, it was he I favored over everybody. I liked Martin King for sure, but I liked Ma Malcolm better because he was tougher. Let's take a vinyl disc, 33 RPM, and play it at 78 speed. And so what you'll come up with with this short scenario of my life is... I, li I like the last part the most, you know. Can you repeat it? <laughs> <laughs> but anyhow, thank you for, for having me in this morning. And uh, I'm happy to be here. <laughs> <laughs> the party goes on. The party goes on. The party is on. Thank you, Benny, for having me and for doing the show, man. It's a beauty, and you're a cool dude. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Larry, you know. And yeah, it's an honor and pleasure, you know, to show your works here at the Molkestraße. And um, yeah, hope to see you soon. And yeah, best wishes to Martin Creek and hope to, uh, we get the chance to see each other soon. You got it. You got it. <laughs> okay, Larry. So uh, yeah, talk to you soon. And also, um, yeah, it was good to see you. <laughs> okay. <laughs>